Okay. Let's get into our, our, our teaching, our text tonight. Now, as I, I said before, uh, we've come to the end of this miracle section. And there's going to be other miracles, of course, in the gospel. But Matthew arranged a bunch of them, uh, a set of three, a set of three, and then really a set of four, in, in chapters 8 and 9. And it's all part of his, his presentation, his, his answer to the question, who is this man? Who can do such things? Now, we're going to review the answer provided by all ten miracles at the very end. But first, let's take up the last two. The healing of two blind men and the casting out of a demon from a deaf-mute man. Okay, let's, let's get into it. First, uh, verse 27. And Jesus went on from there, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. Okay, let's just stop right there. And the thing to note here is what they call Jesus. Have mercy on us, son of David. Now let's, let's talk about that. They are the first people in Matthew's Gospel to call Jesus this, and it's a significant name. It was a clearly understood at the time as a messianic title, one of the titles of the long-form Messiah. Um, this goes back to God's prophecy to David through Nathan in 2 Samuel. Uh, here's, here's the same thing uh, in uh, 1 Chronicles 17. When your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your, own, your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. Now that forever word is very important because we might read that, hear that, and go, wait, wait, wait. he's talking about Solomon, isn't he? After all, Solomon is the son who built the temple. Now, this is going to get us into the whole topic of the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, and they're not as uh, linear and one-dimensional as they might appear, or as we might expect them to be. You see, all prophecies, all the prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus. Everything comes to him. You know, that's Jesus, his Bible study on the road to Emmaus. All of, all of Scripture is, is fulfilled in him. But God gave previews, hints, um, kind of like recurring themes throughout the history of his people. In other words, certain events and people even became prophetic in themselves because they pointed to the ultimate fulfillment. So we have a bunch of like almost fulfillments in the Old Testament, but not quite. They don't quite get us all the way there. And they serve to say this, the total fulfillment is still coming. The Messiah is still coming. So here with, with Solomon, yeah, he built a temple, but he didn't reign forever. The temple didn't last forever. His throne didn't last forever. And Solomon was not perfectly righteous. There's another fulfillment coming, another son, another builder whose throne will last forever, who is perfect in righteousness. That's still coming, okay? So Solomon was like an imperfect preview of who is coming. And the one who is coming is the true son of David. Now this is this was understood uh, by the rabbis, by the teachers of the law. They understood this. And that's why at the time of Christ, son of David was a very clear messianic title. Because the, this is the, those prophecies and other other scriptures pointing to this is the son of David who is to be the Messiah, the anointed one. So you didn't just go around calling people the son of David, even if they were descendants of David, part of that family, you know, from Bethlehem. Because to call somebody, capital letter, son of David, meant Messiah, and it meant king. And of course, then that's loaded with all kinds of political overtones, very controversial. Okay, so by calling Jesus son of David, these two blind men were confessing their confidence that he was indeed the Messiah. This is a big development in the story. And, and Matthew has been kind of leading us here. You know, going back to the angel, the angel's announcement to Joseph in a dream that was connected with David. 
the Magi came looking for what? A king? And, and everything Matthew has been doing with teaching and miracles has been leading us, the reader, to see that this is true. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the son of David. And now, Matthew is informing us that people are catching on. The teaching and the miracles are having an effect. Jesus is becoming to become is beginning to become known as the son of David. Now, notice again what they call to him besides son of David, have mercy on us. That is their plea. They don't specifically tell him what they want him to do, but it's it's pretty clear uh, what they have in mind because it's pretty clear that they are blind. But it's a cry for mercy. It's not a cry of, you owe me, God. Why have you done this to me? You owe me. Fix it. It's a cry for mercy because that is an acknowledgement that they don't deserve it. No sense of entitlement here. And we don't approach God as though he owes us or is obligated to us. Every gift of God is a gift of mercy. Life itself, all we have, all we are, and of course our salvation. Okay, so... We have these two blind men, and they say, Have mercy on us, son of David. What happens next? Let's look at it. When he had gone indoors, when Jesus had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he, he touched them, touched their eyes, and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Okay, a couple, a couple of things about this. Notice this, this, the focus here again is faith, like it was last week. Because now we're, as we're coming to the end of this miracle section, we're focusing on the response to what Jesus has done. Matthew's been supplying lots of evidence, lots of indicators. He's structured this whole thing to... to to depict for us who Jesus is. And this emphasis now on faith, last week and this week, I believe, it's, it's in Matthew's way of like winking to the readers, looking to the, the narrators turning out, out of the story, looking at us and saying, well, do you believe? Do you believe? Now, notice at first, Jesus kept on walking. You know, notice what it says here. He came, he'd gone indoors. So they called to him, and then Jesus goes inside, as though he walked right by them. Why did he do that? Well, it could be that Jesus just didn't want to do this miracle publicly. We've seen that before. Um, he avoids putting on a show. You know, like he sent everybody out of the room last week before he raised the young girl. It could be that he isn't ready for the son of David title to be thrown about. And we'll come back to that later when he tells them to be quiet about their healing. Could also be a, just a test of faith. Faith keeps on believing and trusting when the answer doesn't seem to be coming. I mean, does it ever seem to you that Jesus keeps on walking by when you call to him for mercy? Well, if faith doesn't give up. It pursues him. In this case, goes into the house after him. Okay, now, now let's, let's look at this again. You know, continuing this focus on faith, what would Jesus says to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? Do you see it there? Do, do you believe I am able to do this? You know, it kind of loops us back around to the first miracle back in the beginning of chapter 8, the healing of the leper who said to Jesus, if you are willing, you can, you are able to heal me. You know, it's like, think of all the things we cry out to God for, for healing, for his mercy. Do we believe that he can do these things? And they say, yes, Lord. You know, every time we pray, you know, every time we pray to the Lord, asking him for something, we can think of it, concluding with Jesus saying to us, do you believe I can do this? Do you believe I'm able to do these things? And our amen is the same as yes, Lord. Okay, so Jesus healed them. 
he, he, he touched them. And we've seen that Jesus has no standard method of healing. Sometimes with a word, sometimes with a touch. There's no, you know, no uniform method, which is a reminder, and I think Jesus is teaching us, that it's not about technique or method, because that kind of thinking leads into magic and superstition. The case is that simply Jesus has the power, and he uses it in his mercy. Okay, their sight is restored, the text says. Um, let's look at that again. It just simply says, and their sight was restored. Okay. And you know, look at that. Like I said, Matthew is, is directing this at his readers. Do you believe Jesus can do this? Are your eyes open now? Or are you still blind to who Jesus truly is? I mean, we're not told directly that there's a metaphorical meaning to the opening of the eyes. I mean, that does happen in John chapter 9 with the healing of the man born blind. Matthew doesn't tell us that directly here, but I don't think that's, that's not Matthew's style. He lets his structure do the talking for him, the editorializing. And by putting at the end of all these miracles, the opening of the eyes and the question on faith, and he's asking us, are your eyes open? Do you believe that he is the son of David? Well, then something very interesting happens. Go on to verse 30, actually 30b and 31. It says this, Jesus warned them sternly, sternly, see that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him all over that region. Very interesting here. Okay. Why did Jesus say this? Now, this is sometimes called by scholars the messianic secret. It's much more pronounced in Mark's gospel. And the point is up to a certain point in the gospel, and that point is Peter's confession, Jesus doesn't want people going around spreading the news. Now, he's about to send out his disciples. We'll talk about that next week, but with lots of instructions, okay? It's like Jesus wants to manage the movement. And these guys had just called Jesus son of David, which is true, but it had lots of, lots of political baggage. And a lot of scholars think Jesus didn't want that yet. He wanted to define by his teaching and work what it means to be the Messiah. And there's a big component that he hasn't gotten to yet. Okay, and that's, of course, the cross. And that'll be coming. Uh, he'll start talking about that after Peter's confession in chapter 16. So he wants to define what it means before he wants people running around claiming he's the Messiah. So he told these guys to be quiet and they disobeyed. They sinned. Now this is a weird example right in scripture of evangelism being sinful. Now, it'd be hard to get our mind around that. But they, they, they disobeyed. The essence of sin is disobedience to Jesus. They did not obey. He said, don't do it, and they did it. Now, now we might think, yeah, but, but gosh, the ends justify the means. They're doing evangelism. It's a good thing. More people knowing about Jesus. How can that be wrong? Well, it was wrong for them to do this simply because Jesus told them not to. <laughs> this needs to be taken to heart. And we are... We are so prone to rationalize our sins, to, to justify what we do, because we don't think it's that bad and it actually could have a good outcome. I think it's either not, not it's a big deal. It's just part of our, where our culture shapes our faith. It's our American pragmatism. If it works, it must be okay. How can it be wrong when it feels so right? So, hey, the news is spreading. They must be doing the right thing. But God is God. He has all the wisdom. He knows the big picture. And something may seem right to us 
and is wrong in God's sight. Right? And we know that, right? All goes back to this. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. It seemed like a good idea to them. It was good food, pleasing to the eye. They're going to get wiser. There's just one, one, little, one little problem. God said, don't do it. And that had a lot of negative consequences, right? So it's the same thing, you know, when, when you know, a, a couple says, hey, it just makes sense to move in together before we decide whether to get married so we can see if we're compatible. Makes sense, logical. And Jesus says, no, no. Oh, Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount about, about turning the other cheek. God, I can't do that. I'll be taken advantage of. And Jesus says, do it. You know, holding grudges, telling little white lies, engaging in gossip, um, the things we might view online. I mean, go back and read the Sermon on the Mount. We can rationalize disobedience to nearly everything in there for good earthly reasons, for pragmatic reasons. It makes a lot of sense. But if we're followers of Jesus, then his word is more important than what seems right to us. It's part of faith. Faith is believing Jesus can do what he promised to do. So faith is also believing that Jesus' word is wisdom and truth and life and is always the best way to go in life, even when our earthly wisdom may go a different direction. So even though it may seem like what they were doing was the right thing, they were directly disobeying Jesus. Right after being blessed with his mercy, right after being healed of blindness, right after confessing their faith, they disobey. They walk out of church and start fighting. You know, something like that. Has that ever happened with us? Right after receiving God's blessings to go right back into sin. Very interesting. Okay, we've got another miracle here. Going on, verse 32 and 33a. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. Okay. So, another miracle. The last one of the miracle section. This is number 10. And one that combines the healing healing with the casting out of a demon. We've seen both of those before. So several themes come together. It's a good ending one. But this is very briefly told. We're not told what Jesus said or did to, to bring about the healing. We're not told what was said to him. We're just told the basic facts. The demon was cast out. The man was able to speak. It's really, I think the real point with Matthew and this concluding miracle is the reaction to the miracle. Because we're going to get a, a summary here that sets us up for everything coming down the road. So the, the, this, this extra miracle, we had three, 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 plus this one. And I think this one's really about the reaction. Let's look at that. Matthew 9, 33, B, and 34. The crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Wow, that's quite a contrast, isn't it? The two reactions, very, very different. The crowd amazed, the Pharisees condemning. Okay, so the crowds are amazed. What's interesting about the, the, the statement that the crowds were amazed is that that's very similar to how Matthew concluded the Sermon on the Mount. Look at those words from the end of the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. And as we've seen with the miracles, it has all been about Jesus' authority and having demonstrated his authority, as we're going to summarize in just a minute, the crowd, again, is amazed. Uh, the concluding remark, nothing like this has ever been seen. 
There's something very different about Jesus. His, his teaching is with an authority not seen in their teachers. His deeds, his miracles are unlike anything seen before. Okay, but the Pharisees have a very different take on it all. They're seeing completely the opposite. It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. They're not taking any joy, amazement, or, or rejoicing in all these incredible miracles and healings Jesus had done. So the opposition that we saw at the beginning of this chapter in the healing of the paralytic is now given full voice. He's not the son of David. He's not amazing. His teaching is not with proper authority because he is in league with the devil. And this is this is way beyond they didn't like his personality or his style. Now they aren't calling for his death directly here, but that's the only direction this can go. And it shows us it's it's hinting to us there's there's more to come. So let's let's review what the crowds amazed at and what the Pharisees were rejecting and what we've learned. What have we learned? Uh, from these miracles. A couple of things. One is that Jesus has authority. Now, Sermon on the Mount about his authority and teaching. Here, we've seen Jesus' authority, authority over illness, healing leprosies, other diseases, the woman bleeding, blindness, authority over nature and calming the storm, authority over the demonic and evil, casting out demons, total of three demons he casted out in these two chapters. Authority over sin and judgment and the granting of forgiveness. And authority over death itself, raising the young girl from the dead. So we really, this, this, these, these miracles, Jesus did probably many more than this, but Matthew selected these ones, put them all together because they, they cover like this, this breadth of different areas where Jesus is showing, I'm Lord of this, I'm Lord of that, I'm Lord of that, I'm Lord of that. Okay, that's, that's, that's one thing, Jesus' authority. The other thing that we have seen in this series of miracles is that the blessings of the kingdom are for everybody. Uh, unclean people, like the leper, like the Roman, like the bleeding woman. Enemies, like the Roman and his servant. Uh, the kingdom is for, for women. Now that was an issue at the time. Peter's mother-in-law, the synagogue leader's daughter being raised, the bleeding woman being healed. Uh, the kingdom is for the low and the high. We have beggars coming to Jesus and outcasts, and we have synagogue leaders and Roman centurions. But this is who Jesus is, the Son of God, David, the Messiah, with authority by word and deed, overall bringing a kingdom which is for all. So Matthew concludes what I, and I think this, this last miracle and by the contrasting responses, the crowd amazed, the Pharisees condemning, he concludes what I think is, is an invitation to faith. Do you, reader, do you believe he is the son of David? Do you believe he can do these things? Will you be amazed like the crowd or will you stand in opposition like the Pharisees? Okay, so that's where we are in Matthew. Matthew has Jesus' words, Jesus' deeds. He's laid it all out. He's get, told us what this means. He is the son of David. We see there's different reactions. Now, where do we go? We got a, we got a better picture emerging of who he is. And so next week, we head into a new major section on discipleship with the prayer for harvest workers and the calling of the disciples and the sending of them into the harvest fields. Now we know who Jesus is. Now let's get a glimpse of the big picture, the mission, going out to all the world. So that's, that's next week. So let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you. You are amazing, our amazing God. And when we rightly take to heart your grace, your power, and your goodness, the things you've done and the word you have preserved that we may know it, we can't help but be amazed also like the crowd. 
Lord, we pray you bless us by your Spirit with the faith that this text is calling for. That when we pray, we do so with the confidence that you can do what you have promised. Let our amen at the end of our prayers always be, Yes, Lord, I believe you can do this. You are Lord. You are the Son of David. In this thing we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.